Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, so my name is Stephanie. Um, I'm an engineering recruiter here at Confluent. I wanted to personally uh, welcome everyone here um, to our new offices. Um, hope you had a good time networking upstairs and you know, hope everyone stayed warm. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, you're in for a treat tonight. Um, we have four women from our leadership team um, who will be giving talks. Um, so first will be Neha. She's our chief product officer and also one of our co-founders. She'll be chatting about um, you know, her journey with creating Confluent, starting the company, et cetera. Um, after that, uh, Gwen, um, who is one of our engineering managers, she'll be talking about open source. Um, after Gwen, we Julie. She's our head of data. Um, she will be talking about building a world-class team. Um, last but not least, we'll have Kajal. Um, she's our TPM lead from our engineering team. Um, she'll be talking about um, what it takes to be a great TPM and basically how to herd cats. <laughs> um, anyway, um, welcome again um, and please enjoy. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our very first uh, external Confluent uh, Women in Tech event. I hope you all are as excited as I am to make new connections, learn something new, and ask lots of questions. So let's get started. Um, uh, you know, my talk is going to be a little bit about my journey of starting uh, Kafka, event streaming, starting the company Confluent, but then also a little bit about uh, my experience in tech uh, as I navigated this journey. And then uh, toward the end, we'll take questions, all the speakers together. So hold on to some of your questions uh, until uh, we all finish. All right, so I want to start a little bit uh, with my journey. Um, I was born and brought up in India. I learned uh, to operate computers um, probably when I was eight years old, mostly to play video games and, and uh, you know, scribble in MS Paint and whatnot. So while I didn't learn to write code as I was learning to read and write, like all the other Wits Kids stories you might have heard in the Valley, it uh, did inspire me enough to take up computer science. I moved to the US to uh, you know, do my master's in computer science. Right out of school, uh, I took up a job in a big company to realize that uh, I wanted to move much faster. I realized the open source community is meritocratic and, and uh, would help me learn new technologies. And so I specifically picked a company that had a first class investment in open source, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is where I got a chance to uh, teach myself distributed systems, got a chance to start uh, Apache Kafka, open sourced it. It became very popular. I uh, spotted a business opportunity around it. I was lucky enough uh, that my co-founders agreed to start this company with me. That was only five years ago. And today, uh, we're close to 900 employees worldwide. And, and uh, we're only just getting started. Uh, on the fun side, uh, <laughs> thank you. So uh, I, I do have fun, uh, and so uh, for that I travel, uh, I scuba dive, and I uh, do a fair bit amount of retail therapy. Uh, I must say that works fairly well. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, most of my career has been about uh, introducing uh, the concept and the category of event streaming into the world uh, via uh, Apache Kafka, which is the technology that, that sort of brought this to the forefront. So I wanted to start a little bit with, uh, you know, the why behind this entire movement. So at LinkedIn, we were facing a pretty unique challenge, and that was that, um, you know, our... our LinkedIn users were using the website uh, pretty much 24-7. They expected real-time experiences, which they got. But our challenge was all of LinkedIn's software couldn't get access to the user events as they were happening in real time. So we could customize user interactions, offer real-time experiences. And doing that meant you know, processing and collecting billions of events in real time per day. No other technology did that. Uh, we did you know, start by hacking around other technologies to see if we could just make them work rather than start something new, which seems pretty hard to do. But uh, we couldn't succeed with hacking anything out there. And so we started Apache Kafka, which was designed, uh, it is designed to process real-time data at massive scale. Uh, we had this inkling that, you know, this problem of processing uh, data and, and being data-driven companies and real-time couldn't have just been a LinkedIn problem. And so we open-sourced this technology so we could democratize it. And uh, sure enough, uh, we were right. In the first couple of years, uh, the 
the most tech savvy companies in silicon valley picked it up and in the short uh, couple of years down the line uh, the rest of the world picked it up to a point where we were basically helping these big enterprises uh, kind of for free and so that's when i uh, said we should just start a company around this uh, so we can get paid for all that help uh, so today we know that uh, you know kafka is used as a digital central nervous system in tens of thousands of companies worldwide uh, to a point where about 60% of even the Fortune 100 companies are using it as a core technology platform. So it really is mainstream now. Uh, this sort of traction for infrastructure software, right, data software, it's kind of rare. And it usually happens not just because there's a good product out there, but it's because there's a broader paradigm shift happening in the industry. So that paradigm shift in the last 10 years is that you know, businesses are not just using more software, they're literally becoming software. So what, what I mean by that is you don't call a cab anymore, you actually just open an app and it orchestrates an entire ride and it charges for that ride entirely through software. Right? You don't go to an ATM teller anymore, you manage bank transactions online and so on and so forth. So entire parts of businesses are actually being replaced by software and that is really changing how businesses use software and data to build their products. Now that's the business paradigm shift, but what happens is it leads to a lot of technology paradigm shifts because it's a pretty big change. So these are the technology paradigm shifts that you all might be aware of. You know, companies are using the public cloud to drive developer productivity. They want to use data and machine learning to make better business decisions. Uh, we want to design mobile first customer experiences. And last but not the least, the foundation of data is changing. It's changing from batch to real time. And that's what event streaming is all about. So obviously it's one of the big trends, but what's special about event streaming is it actually plays a role in enabling the other three or four paradigm shifts. It plays a role in helping companies move to the cloud. It helps, uh, you know, plays a role to get data to machine learning models so you can deploy them in real time. It, it plays a role in uh, designing these real time mobile experiences. And so that kind of shows in the event streaming sort of disruption in actual entire industries, right, and how they're using it. So this is what some of our customers do with Kafka and Confluent products is your ETA, your ride-sharing app is doing ETA and search pricing using Confluent products. Your fraud detection on your credit card transactions happens using uh, Confluent products. Uh, not only that, but all the retailers you might be shopping at do real-time inventory management and a lot of other things using Confluent. And even your Netflix movie recommendations are powered by Kafka. So it really does span a lot of different industries, which kind of speaks to the broad paradigm shift. Okay, so that was a little bit about the, the what um, and the technology part of my journey. I get asked a fair bit amount about what it all felt like, so I wanted to spend a couple minutes about sharing some of my career experiences. Uh, my career has felt a little bit like this. Um, you know, it's a, it's a little bit like an obstacle race where not all of the obstacles are technical in nature. Uh, I probably, you know, for instance, worked harder than our male counterparts to get the same thing, and the list just keeps going on and on. And, and you ask yourself, uh, why does it have to be this hard? You know, well, what can you do to make it a little bit easier? And so, uh, you know, so at times it can get a little discouraging. So uh, I'll, I'll share what my, uh, you know, an insight that my brother shared. He is a many times Ironman uh, triathlon finisher. And, and he shared with me that, you know, if you go into swim a mile in the ocean after just having trained to swim a mile in the pool and you expect to feel the same, you're going to be pretty disappointed. And uh, so knowing the course and, and what you're in for actually just helps, uh, you know, sort of solve part of the problem, right? So in the moment, it felt, um, it feels like an obstacle race, but when I zoom out and I try to think about the whole experience, it is actually a little bit like crossing a chasm. And uh, I call this chasm the credibility chasm, and then there's a reason for this, is it, it's, it's really two ends of a spectrum where early on in your career, uh, the experiences that underrepresented minorities have is you get uh, you know questioned quite a bit. You have to prove yourself quite a bit more. Um, you are marginalized early on in your career until 
you work hard and, and struggle and make it to the other side of the spectrum. And when you make it there, you actually get noticed and frequently and you get celebrated for your achievements and the whole experience is entirely different from what it felt like in the beginning but it takes quite an effort to be able to cross this chasm uh, while i haven't quite crossed that chasm uh, what has kept me going uh, is a combination of you know long-term thinking and a whole ton of grit so uh, every now and then, uh, you know, I take a step back and think about decisions that would help long-term goals. And I'm pretty stubborn and persistent to keep going after it. So it's pretty much a combination of those two factors that's, that keeps me going, not to mention that it is hard. Uh, who in the audience knows uh, what this picture is about? Israel, yes. Uh, it is a picture from uh, India's space research organization when they made history. And um, they, they sent a, a satellite into the Mars orbit for the very first attempt uh, at probably one tenth the cost of any other mission in the world. So they did quite make history, and this picture went viral back then. Uh, and the reason I show it is because, you know, when, when young girls in India look at this picture, uh, they actually believe that they also can be uh, part of uh, a mission like this. You know, they could be rocket scientists and satellite designers and, and whatnot. Uh, that is the power of role models, uh, instilling the conviction in you that if someone who looks like you can do the impossible, then maybe, just maybe, you can attempt to do the same. Uh, role models have played a pretty big um, you know, role in my own journey. Uh, when I was little, my parents uh, self-selected these stories and books of uh, popular female role models. Uh, in all kinds of walks of life, uh, all the way from Prime Minister of India to uh, you know, CEO of a big corporation, uh, to uh, the head of Indian Police Services. And uh, I didn't realize it back then, but what it actually did for me is it sort of instilled this conviction in me that, oh, you know, if all of these women could do this really impossible task of crashing ceilings, then possibly I could do the same. Uh, and, and so I, I really do believe that uh, role models play a pretty big uh, you know, role in driving change. Uh, a little bit beyond role models, this is what I believe we, we all can do, right, is, is actually develop a real sisterhood uh, that will take us very far in driving small and big changes to see the change we want to see in the industry, right? So what do I mean by that? We can contribute in, in small and big ways like this to come together. Uh, and the small ways are actually fairly simple things to do. You know, you can pull a fellow woman aside to give candid feedback on how she may improve. You may want to stop a conversation in a meeting to hear her out. You want to give credit publicly and so on. And all these things really do, if we all stick together, make a pretty big you know, difference in our experiences. Uh, I get to see this quite a lot day to day at Confluent. It keeps me going personally. So I will say, like, encourage everyone to participate in that movement. And, and that's about it all. I want to keep it short. And these are lightning talks. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to your questions. But for now, I'm going to pass the baton over to Gwen Shapira, who's going to talk about open source. Hey, everyone. Work? Can you hear me? Cool. Hey, everyone. It's amazing to see so many women in technology here. It's just great and very, very encouraging evening. Uh, so I'm going to talk about contributing to open source projects. Uh, kind of, maybe some of you have thought that you want to do it, and if you didn't, maybe I'll convince some of you to give this a try. So good talks, like uh, good software, starts with setting our assumption. We don't just build things in vacuum. Uh, so I don't know all your backgrounds, and I'm going to give a slightly kind of honest talk. So it's important that you'll know mine. Uh, so I basically uh, worked um, in specific parts of the industry. I worked as a software engineer. I worked in the open source only on Apache projects, only on data infrastructure. So if you're thinking that you want to contribute to React because you are a JavaScript developer and you like front end, probably my experiences will be very different. But I'm going to share very honestly my experiences working on data infrastructure projects, several of them for the Apache Software Foundation. 
So if you look at kind of my resume, there is a lot of it. It comes with being very, very old. Um, you can see that I worked in very a lot of different companies, always on uh, data stores and data architectures. And, uh, but a lot of my resume is not from working at a company. It's working on open source projects. It's extracurriculars, writing books. This is something that I kind of encourage people to do. I think this day and age, you can really build yourself and your interests and your career, not just in your workplace, but also outside the workplace. And really open source is a lot about being able to take your career outside of just the normal, this job and then that job and then the other job. So open source means a lot of different things to different people. Uh, as I said, I worked at, on Apache Software Foundation projects. Uh, those Apache Software Foundation has the saying that community over code. The way we all work together, the way we come together, the way we help each other out, the way we make decisions as a group is actually far more important than the product that happens as a result of that. So in Apache, they tell you build a community and good software will follow. And they pay a lot of attention into how you build a community, how you grow new members. Is your community growing? Is it active? Are people in course? And this is really important. Uh, so for me, the open source experience is an, open, is an experience in building communities of people coming together and not just uh, 20 lines of code today and 50 lines of code tomorrow. So one of the things that you really need to know when you get into open source is that it's actually really hard. It's way harder than your day job because you work with a lot of different people, different companies, uh, different interests, different priorities, and you have to somehow all come together and work together to build something more or less in your spare time. So it's uh, but obviously like much harder uh, level of effort, which means that you need a really, really good reason to do it. And you need to kind of look within yourself and ask yourself, why am I putting all of this in? Because it's really hours of effort and being very patient and trying to do better and better. So for me, the reason that I'm doing it is because of the autonomy it gives me and the opportunities it opens up. If you work at a specific company, your opportunities are very much shaped by the companies that you currently work for. Which projects are available right now? What does the company focus on? What's the company priorities? What does my manager cares about? What does my manager think that I can do? And if for whatever reason, or for normality, your manager got the impression and maybe doesn't think super highly of you, you will be stuck in this really annoying cycle where you don't have the opportunity to prove that you can do better and therefore you never do anything more interesting, which is really frustrating. And I've happened to be there in a few times in my career Open source basically gives you the op option to look at all the projects in the world. Do I want to do machine learning? Do I want to do data, do write a database from scratch? Did you ever try writing a database from scratch? Did you try writing an operating system? Did you think of writing a network device driver? You have all those different options. What excites you? What calls to you? What seems like the great new opportunity for you? And you have control even within the project. You pick which bugs you want to work on, which features. Is this big enough? Is this challenging for me? You have full control over that. And for me, this is just huge. And you get exposed to different ways of working. Not everyone works like the way your team currently does. Not everyone reviews code the same way. Not everyone has the same standards. They have new techniques, new design patterns, new programming languages. You can, it kind of opens up a whole world of opportunities, which is strongly, strongly recommended. Obviously, there's a cost. As I said, it's not easy. One thing that I say, reasons to do it, to do open source, are many, and you look within yourself and find them. Maybe it's an opportunity to change the world, learning new skills, but there are some bad reasons. And one of the things that sometimes I run into, Apache Software Foundation has the idea that projects have contributors, and then they have committers who kind of approve changes to the project, and then they have like those different levels. Uh, people sometimes show up and ask, how do I become a committer? And this is basically like showing up as a new engineer at the company and asking, how do I become a manager? I mean, it's nice, we like people with ambition, but it's also kind of like, well, you become a committer or a manager by working really, really hard over time. You need to have a reason to work hard over time. So it's kind of chicken and egg, and you need to find a reason before you say, I want to advance to the next level. Obviously, 
being clear that you want to advance, being ambitious is 100% okay, even awesome. So you now figure out why. There's also a matter of timing, when to start contributing to open source. Because there is something in the industry where sometimes people get the advice that if you're a new grad and you just get started, people tell you, oh, you should contribute to open source and kind of start building up your resume. It pretty much sets people for a lot of frustration because as a new grad, and I had saying it to all the new grads in the office, you don't know a lot. You know a lot in some things, you don't know a lot about developing software in a group. That's one of the things that don't really teach you a lot as a new grad, which means that you show up to the open source project, your learning curve is much steeper than anyone else. And as I already said, it's really, really hard. So people will try to help, but they have limited time and limited patience. And as opposed to when joining as a new grad to a company with like a strong mentorship program, people have a lot more resources to invest in you. So it's kind of like, well, maybe wait one to three years after, until you really solidified your software engineering skills. And then you join an open source project, you bring more to the table, you can learn better, you can learn faster, uh, you'll get more out of the core review comments and out of the discussions. So I normally recommend kind of waiting a tiny bit. Okay, so we know when, but how? How do you do it? How do you get started? That's kind of the big question, right? Uh, so the first thing is that you pick a project. How do you pick a project? What are you interested in, right? Do you want to learn machine learning, front-end, UI, uh, write a database, write a network device driver? Who knows, right? So you pick something. You also pick a community. Are they nice? Are they helpful? Are they answering questions? Do they give good feedback? Do you have good interactions? Do you have good vibes? You look into the mailing list. Is that like a good, active, vibey, cool community? Uh, are there any red flags? Do you see people being not so nice to each other? Super, super important to look at all that. And then after you join the project, you, the first thing, the first contribution you normally want to do is a bug fix. How do you find a bug? Well, usually bugs find you. <laughs> Either you, you kind of use the product and you'll immediately find bugs because open source project. We say community over code. It sometimes translates to community over quality. Uh, open source projects tend to have some bugs in them. Uh, also, non-open source projects tend to have some bugs in them. Uh, so you find a bug. If you cannot find it yourself, there's usually some kind of a Jira or GitHub, a list of all the bugs. Pick one that looks doable. Some of the, in nice projects, some things are mar marked newbie. So you pick something that is marked newbie. And the benefit of having a bug fix is that everyone will agree that you have to fix it. Versus if you say, I want to have this new feature and you're new, so people are like, well, I, we don't think we need this feature. So you kind of get into the stupid arguments. Uh, so fix a bug, everyone will appreciate it. And the next thing that will happen is that you will get lots of feedback. Why will you get lots of feedback? Because people who worked on the project care about it a lot. So you'll get feedback. And the key is not to get intimidated when people say, oh, your bug fix is crap. You have to show that you thought about it. So you have to defend it a bit because you want to show that you did your good work and you can kind of explain why you think it's good. That's why you want to be experienced. Uh, but you don't want to seem too um, kind of defensive. So you want to be open to feedback, but also not, uh, but also shows that you can explain. Yes, balancing acts are super hard. This is actually not that specific to uh, male versus female. I think everyone has to go kind of show that they thought about their work, but also open to feedback. So you do this and hopefully it was a good experience. Obviously, hopefully you actually got good comments and you had a good discussion. I thought I'll do it your, this way, but you're right. Your way is actually better or no, my way is actually better. So you have a good discussion. And then you kind of get to bond with people through that. That's an important part of uh, how the discussion goes. And then you kind of do your own retrospective or introspection. Did it go as well as, ex as expected? Am I still excited about the project? Do I still like people there? Is it still going well for me? Do you feel like you can get what you had a reason for contributing? Do you feel like you get what you want out of this project? And if yes, basically continue the cycle. Find a bigger bug to fix. Find some cooler features to work on. Do something that excites you because there has to be a good reason for that. And then at some point, after a while, it may take six months or a year, uh, you're currently an experienced contributor. You've been there for a long time. You can start mentoring others, helping others, leaving code reviews. Something that people often don't realize is that 
doing core reviews is leadership, right? You're looking at someone's work and you give them direction on how to do better and kind of guiding their way through the project. This is leadership and a good form of leadership. So that's kind of how the cycle goes. You learn the code and then you can help others get involved as well. Okay, so now we know when, why, how, uh, what? What projects are you going to work on? What are we, how are we going to do it? Well, in, I'm slightly biased, only a tiny bit, but I have a really good open source project to recommend to all of you. Uh, Apache Kafka is a very fun project. I, five, six years ago, almost when I started contributing, I jumped to the mailing list, started talking to people. I found that it has strong female leaders, which I uh, admired. I found that uh, people were nice and civil to each other. The discussion was super respectful. I tried to fix a tiny small bug. I had uh, one of the project founders give me some helpful comments. I didn't agree. I pushed back. He actually ended up agreeing with me. We merged the facts and it, ever since we've been kind of keeping it going. So highly recommended. Apache Kafka grew a lot. It used to be that you had to know Scala. Now you can know Scala, Java, Python. Uh, we have all kinds of things in there. Uh, you can also, it used to be that you had to write kind of the broker distributed systems, but now we have Kafka Connect if you like databases. We have the Kafka Streams if you want to write stream processing. So the project grew a lot and you can find a lot of interests in there. Now the last step is really to find a home for your contributions. I already said that open source is good when you do it kind of in your spare time, but it's actually a lot better when you do it at work. <laughs> so you kind of want to look for a company that encourages open source, that really has proven long lasting contributions to the open source community. And it's okay to ask that. It's okay when you interview to ask, uh, does the team contribute to open source? How much of my time? What kind of approvals do I need to contribute to open source? There are companies that will tell you, oh, you need to jump through this, 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 and this hoops. And there are companies that say, well, you join that team and part of the job, some of the contributions go to an open source community. And that's true, obviously. Here, there's other companies that do the same thing. But it's kind of the thing. One of the things to remember is that just because you join the company with open source creds doesn't mean that you will get to work on open source. So I know that some really, really big companies, Google, Facebook, all those, they all have some people working on open source. So you kind of want to make sure that uh, how do you get over there. Uh, but in my mind, highly rewarding and highly worth it. So recommended. And as I said, question, as <laughs> Neha said, questions at the end. And the next uh, speaker will be Julie, our head of data science, talking about building data science teams. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Julie. I lead a data team here. Um, thanks for Neha. I know what book I would read for my five-year-old daughter tonight. <laughs> it's gonna be a female role model book. And thanks for Gwen. I know what project I will ask my 11-year-old son to work on next time. <laughs> Great, um, I'm going to uh, share a little bit my experience like building a world-class data team. Uh, right here in Confluent or anywhere um, in the world. A little bit about my, uh, about my experience professionally. Um, I was trained as an economist, um, but then during my uh, graduate school study, I got to work on a lot of like data analysis, empirical study. That's how I got very, very uh, intrigued into this data world. I, I really uh, enjoy crunching data and trying to find evidence and like validate or like um, break assumptions. So that's why I decided to pursue another degree in statistics, which is pure data. Um, I was very fortunate to kind of entering an era with all the big data revolution and data. The amount of data is like just amazing and the way people use data is like really transformative. So I started my career um, as an analy analytics data sci uh, scientist in FICO, which is a credit scoring company. So if you guys want, I can still manual score your FICO score. <laughs> um, just kidding, the model keep you warming every year. 
Um, but it was a financial industry company. It was very well um, kind of structured, a very good place to learn uh, how to build models in real world. But then after a couple of years, it got a little bit boring because it moves pretty slowly. So that's why I uh, jumped to eBay, uh, which was an internet company. So it got to it, like touch a lot more data. And then you have a lot of fun with when you have you know, that amount of data at your uh, fingertip. That's also where I got you know, to uh, kind of um, in touch with modern data science stack like Hadoop, um, you know, Python, streaming, all the things uh, that I was very fun there. Uh, then I joined LinkedIn, um, which is an amazing company. And that's also where I transformed my career from an individual contributor to a manager. Uh, this, I was, I'm very, very grateful for my experience in LinkedIn. It's a wonderful place, um, and I learned so much from there. So a year ago, I joined Confluent uh, for a lot of good reasons, which I'll share later. Um, it's been a blast so far. I really enjoy working here, um, and I'll share my experience building my team here. Great. All right, as I mentioned, um, probably as same as everybody, I started my career as an individual contributor. But maybe a little bit to the uh, kind of extreme side of it, like I started my career in a little bit dramatic way. Um, so I, my first job was um, in the year of 2008. So if you remember, there was a financial crisis here, which was like everybody's losing job. So I was a new hire at that time. And my first baby was two months old. Um, and I was like under um, immigration visa. So all the the only thing I had on my mind is to keep my job. Like, I need this job for my family, for my immigration status. I just, I was totally in the survival mode. There's no, like, idea of what, like, leadership management is like. Just, I have no time for that. <laughs> I just need to make, get my heads down and do my work and keep this job. And that mindset actually stayed with me for a very long time. I just didn't really feel like, um, you know, I have this talent or like potential in me to, to be a manager, to be a leader. You know, I just keep my head down to my work and that's about it. Um, however, I definitely uh, changed over the years. Um, you know, as I started like progressing, um, do, do a really good work as I see, and I get the opportunity at LinkedIn to kind of um, expose to management opportunities to start mentor people, um, guide interns, and start hiring a small team, working with executives, and realize like I actually can do much more if I lead a team, if I build a team, if I like really um, making a much bigger impact as a leader um, over the progress. So that was like really something very transformative, like starting like thinking about from a team perspective, how do you amplify your impact? Um, and then you can totally do it. Like, you know, my experience, my background can do it, everybody can do it. Uh, it's just very encourage, encouraging looking back my career, like um, starting from focusing as a builder myself um, to start building a team there. All right, so how, what it does it take to build an awesome team? Um, in my mind, there are three things. Um, the first thing, actually, I think the most critical thing is that you need to truly, truly believe in the mission um, of the place you are going. So are you in a company, if you join a company, is a company's mission something you really resonate and you feel passionate about it and it keeps you up at night every day? Um, and then that, that has to be it. Um, before, like, if you want to really be successful and building, like, really successful team on the company. So here in Confluent, the company mission really speaks to me. Um, so I, I, most, I work on data science. I'm not a data engineer myself, but data is so critical, near and dear to my heart. I understand the value and the mission of our company to build um, event streaming platform enables company to easily access data as real-time streams really speaks to me. Uh, I just feel very excited to build, like, be part of it and then help build a, a streaming platform and put it into every single modernized company's heart. So that's something really, really excites me and motivates me to come to work and build a successful team to make that happen. And that's company-wise, right? But more, uh, also, very importantly, as a team, like, what's your mission? How do you contribute to this really exciting company, company mission, right? Um, so for here, our data team in Confluent, um, I'm very, that's also another reason why I decided to join. We're working on everything we can 
to help the company to be successful, to open, optimize every aspect of it. So we build data warehouse, data infra, to make the data you know, available, democratize it to everybody to enable uh, we become a data-driven company. We also work on all kinds of cross-functional projects to help guide from the question of, should we you know, open a new op office in Dubai next year? Uh, so we have data around it to support the assumption to the, answer the question of, oh, um, how are we, like, do we see any ROI from certain like paid media from marketing, right? Or to the question of how can we help our cloud infrastructure to be more cost effective? How do we use optimization model, um, you know, to, to kind of reduce cost and lower our pricing and make our uh, streaming platform more affordable to every company? So we help drive a lot of strategic impactful projects on the company operation and that we can totally see clearly how our teams work contribute to our company mission. And that's really, really important because um, I truly believe in that. When I talk to my candidates, I kind of share the same uh, enthusiasm with them. I think that's been working really well. Um, second thing is that the team culture is also very important. Um, I feel like the authenticity is really, really um, critical um, because authenticity and transparency, I think they are the key. Um, our company has a great culture of um, basically um, promoting transparency. We share everything we can across the whole company. Using my example, a year ago when I joined, everything the interview committee told me, uh, including our CEO, including our CFO, uh, the recruiting, everything they told me, good about it, bad about it, challenges. A year later, I look back, it's all true. <laughs> so I think we have a great company culture um, promoting transparency and team level. We, don't to, we want to be authentic to each other, right? We want to encourage everybody to come to work feeling themselves. They bring their best self to the team, to the work. That's, that's exactly how you can really feel most empowered and feel like you really be, belong there. So, um, you know, you, are, you show your vulnerability, you show honest and constructive feedbacks to each other. You know, we want everybody to improve. Like, I gave you feedback, but I have you in the back, right? So I think that kind of level of trust and also like transparency um, is really, really important to keep ourselves like as a very engaged team and improving from, um, you know, every day. Last but not least is like, um, you know, you have this great mission, the, you know, in high impact work that motivates you to come to work. You have a great team culture, but you're still gonna be frustrated all the time, right? You're gonna be challenged by all the different difficulties on day-to-day -day work. Uh, so that, that's, that's why very important as a manager, I, my responsibility is to empower my team, making sure like uh, as a manager, you're, 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 you know, the best thing you can do is not really write you know, the code like, like every day. You're, you can bring most value to your company, to your team by empowering your team member, right? Making sure they can make the most out of them, right? giving them the right scope of work, uh, making sure you know, they, um, they get feedback from you, they get coaching, they get mentorship, uh, when unblock them when there's a difficulty. So definitely like empowering the team is manager's first job in my opinion. Um, and also like in, on the team, we have to support each other, right? So every team member joining, we, Definitely awesome people, but everybody has their strength, have their weakness, and then we need to be really supporting each other. And then that way we can place to play to strength. As a team, we are really like super capable in everything, like combining together. But we need to have that kind of uh, empowerment and leverage uh, so we can go together. All right. So, um, well, when I joined last year, <laughs> um, I was the second data scientist to the team. Now we have a about 12 people. Um, and this is a little bit extended family of our data team. Um, uh, what it feels like to, when you're working on a great team? Like you feel this is, you have fun, you feel excited coming to work every day. Um, you feel the team is really one team. We have each other in the back. This is a picture we took a few weeks ago in our Confluent Wing, which is a Halloween celebration. We decided to dress up uh, using my manager's daily outfit. <laughs> so he's always wearing Hawaii shirts and jeans and loafers. So what is that to join, uh, dress the same way he does? 
and then we Photoshop um, his face on everybody's face. So <laughs> that kind of embody like the whole one team culture. Uh, we have each other in the back, and we are one team. You know, we have one goal. Uh, we're really, really happy to come to work every day. That's from me. Um, thank you very much, and I'll hand over to Kajo. Thank you, Julie. Uh, show of hand, uh, guys, how many of you have uh, worked with the TPM and understand what the TPM does? Okay, all right, maybe 20, 30 percent of you. Uh, I'm hoping at the end of this talk, everyone uh, leaves your understanding what TPM, uh, what value TPM brings uh, to a company. Uh, so hey, guys, uh, in true TPM fashion, I'm going to start my talk by giving you the context on what I want you to take away from, uh, from it. So this talk will be successful if I get across the following, my journey and my career transformations that I made through it, what value does a good uh, TPM bring to a company, and uh, the importance of working on something that you're uh, really passionate about. Uh, this slide talks about uh, my journey, uh, and I'm going to walk you through a couple of my career transformations through it. So I grew up in Mumbai. I uh, was fortunate to graduate uh, from a great school with good grades. I, uh, you know, for college, I had the option to pick science and, well, nothing. In India, if you get good grades, science just loses you. Uh, so uh, in, in school, I had this uh, opportunity to pick an elective subject, uh, accounting. And believe it or not, I love accounts. Uh, I'm not embarrassed to say that. I, I love accounts. Um, I'm, a, uh, you know, I, I'm a numbers person. I truly uh, enjoyed accounting, and I still enjoy it a lot. So when it came time after my 10th grade to pick a career, uh, I put my foot down and told my parents that uh, I want to become a CPA. So I'm going to pick commerce, which is the equivalent of business school here uh, in US instead of science. Uh, so my parents understandably so wanted to understand the rational behind my choice. But instead of pushing me to uh, pick science, they, they were like, OK, uh, they let me uh, you know, pursue my passion uh, with numbers. Little did they know that. Uh, my love for business school ended with my passion for numbers, with math and accounts. I hated everything else in business school. Uh, everything else just tested my memory skills uh, instead of my problem solving skills. So uh, at the same time, my brother was here in the US doing his master's. So uh, on my 17th birthday, he happened to send me a birthday card with a letter which said that, uh, hey, I know how much you enjoy problem solving. I wish you had picked a uh, career in computers. I think you would have really liked it. And, uh, you know, I still have that letter with me in my house in Mountain View. Uh, when uh, I couldn't sleep for a few nights, I basically gathered the courage and walked up to my parents. And I told them that, uh, you know, I made a mistake. I want to fix it. It's on me. But I want to become a computer scientist. And uh, this time, like in India, it's almost next to impossible. Once you pick a career, it's very difficult to change in midstream. So this time, again, my parents, like, put a lot of trust, belief, and a lot of money in my uh, passion to pursue my career in computer science. And I made a bold move. I uh, gave my SATs, came here to do my undergrad, made the switch to computer science, uh, did it from Virginia Tech, graduated two years later with a major in computer science and a minor in math uh, with magna cum laude. Then I went on to do my master's from Johns Hopkins, uh, uh, also in computer science. And I was, a, uh, I was a software engineer for the first five years of my career. Um, and uh, don't get me wrong, I actually enjoyed writing code. I, I enjoy solving problems by writing code. Call it quarter life crisis or call it the fact that I spend 80% of my time at Microsoft fixing bugs written by someone who had, uh, you know, I inherited code from someone who, was, who had literally left Microsoft to buy his own island. I'm not kidding, seriously, this is like a true fact. I was, I was a little disillusioned and I was like, okay, I, uh, I don't know what I, I'm doing here. Um, and at the same time, my, I, I made another career, uh, career transformation at that point. So my office mate at the time had, uh, you know, he was, he sowed the seed of program management in my head and it helped because both of us had worked with one of the best program managers we worked with till date. Uh, he's, he's one of those guys who everyone on the team, like looked up to him as someone, uh, if you have a technical problem or a people problem, we just walked up to him and he would solve it for us. And I really wanted to be that guy. So I uh, made him my mentor. A uh, few months later, I made the switch to program management. This was in 2006, and I haven't looked back since. So after Microsoft, I've been a TPM at Zynga, Twitter, LinkedIn, and now, uh, most recently, I joined Confluent. 
So what values does a good TPM bring to a company? So I'm going to go over a few, few of those. Cat herding, you guys have, most of you have probably heard about this. That's the definition expert uh, Wikipedia. But how does this apply to engineering? Uh, so often on uh, initiatives, there are you know, multiple teams who are working on their individual pieces. But you need someone to kind of uh, make sure that everyone is looking and heading in the same direction, keeping the final goal in mind. And at the same time, you know, steering every decision making and every, uh, uh, like essentially every outcome towards that, uh, towards that goal. And that person is often the TPM. Uh, whose, go whose, char uh, whose charter it is to make sure that they bring it home together and tie it all together at the end. I cannot emphasize enough how important the T in the TPM is. Uh, having been a software engineer in the past uh, helped me tremendously because before I made the switch to a TPM role, because it's easy for me to empathize with, connect with, and earn the respect, most importantly, of the engineering teams that I work with when I can speak their language. I don't actually have to get involved in every technical decision that gets made, but I choose to do it, do it if my bandwidth allows for it. And the reason for that is because, uh, you know, it, I want to understand the rationale behind some of the decisions that are getting made. Later down the road, that often helps me with identifying ga gaps and dependencies in the project. Lastly, I don't write code for a living anymore, but I work with some of the smartest guys in the Valley who do. And in order to do that, uh, fine. I, the only way I can do that is by staying in touch with technology. So a few things that I do to stay in touch with technology, I keep myself abreast with what's happening in the valley. Uh, if I hear about a technology that I have never heard about in a meeting, I take note of it and I do my research offline so that I can make sense of that conversation. And lastly, I, uh, every once in a while, I take up a coding class. And the reason I do that is I just don't want to lose the confidence that I can still write code. And uh, it's sort of like, you know, every time I go back to India, I drive my dad's stick shift car in Mumbai traffic, just because I know I'm, I just want to make sure I can still do it, essentially. <laughs> Act like an owner. In different companies, TPMs are given the title of, you know, you're a driver, you're a co-driver, you are an owner, you're a co-owner. It doesn't matter. You own the damn problem if you're driving something, right? Like, you need to be biased towards action. You need to be, uh, you know, you need to be, effectively, you need to detect bottlenecks and be able to uh, unblock people. As a, and you're the enabler. What that means is when people come to you with questions, you don't always have to have the answers. But you need to know how to get them the answers. Don't leave them hanging. Like You need to get them and get them the answer. And lastly, be paranoid. Be, it's sort of like being a parent. Uh, think of everything possible that could potentially go wrong and have a plan to address it. Chances are some of it will go wrong, and when it does, you, you would know what to do. Again, having been an engineer, <laughs> having been an engineer in the past, uh, when I used to say that it's, something is done, what I usually meant was, I've, I'm done writing my code, I'm done testing it, it works in my happy world. As a TPM, uh, what done really means is, the combined work of multiple such engineers across multiple different teams, when put together, it works as expected. And you know, it's extremely important to take things through the finish line and deliver the product that you've told that you would deliver. Success for a TPM, in my mind, uh, is twofold. One is, I, I, feel, I feel good when uh, you know, someone looks up to me as the go-to person, the first person that they think of as when something is not looking right, and they are like, oh, I need to go to Kajal to, and I, bring it, I need to bring it to our attention. That's success for me, because they, they trust me that if they come to me, it's going to get resolved. And building that trust is extremely important as a TPM. And how do you build that trust? The way you build that trust is by consistently not dropping the ball on things. The trust is built by delivering consistently over time. As a TPM, you often need to send you know, status updates to increase visibility with management and execs. These are just a few tips on, how to, uh, on what you should look for in a good status update. Uh, I usually have a summary or a TLDR section. Basically, don't assume that everyone who's going to get this email cares about every single detail that you care about. Chances are 80% of them are just going to read the summary section and be done on their iPhones. Uh, so make that extremely crisp and clear. In the details of the email, uh, you, you might want to include all the details as links, but keep it clear and simple. Make, make sure that if you want to include more details in the body, 
people should understand what you're trying to get. If there are any risks on the projects, uh, make sure you highlight them very well and try to call out the trade-off options. When you're sending this uh, message out, or this, uh, th there's a reason you're sending it out, and you want to call out like hey, to execs and management that, hey, this is a risk. These are the potential trade-offs that we need to consider for it. Um, so they know what their choices are. And lastly, try to uh, send your updates at a regular cadence. Don't just send things, uh, emails out when things are going wrong. People tend to associate you with that then. Uh, even if things are going swimmingly well, just send an update out. It's fine to let people know that things are going fine. Around managing risk, there are a couple of don'ts and corresponding do's for those. Uh, so don't avoid going on a project from green to red. Uh, you know, monitor your potential risks and plan for a yellow to highlight those risks. And avoid taking anyone by surprise. It, it doesn't matter when, you know, what the reason was and why the person was surprised and whether it was your fault or not. If you're a TPM in a project and if someone is surprised, it's on you. Acknowledge it and assure, that, assure them that it won't happen again. Be organized. You can't organize others if you are not organized yourself. So have a mechanism, whatever it is whatever works for you to track your daily tasks. For me, something as simple as Google Docs works really well. I start my mornings every morning before I come into work. I just go over my to-do list for the day. I plan my day around my meetings and uh, my to-do items. And then, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I kind of validate against it and see where I landed with those items. And whatever didn't get done, chances are not everything will get done. Whatever didn't get done, I, I make sure that I plan for it in the upcoming days. As a parent, the one thing I've learned is time is precious. So, uh, you know, manage it wisely. At work, uh, there are lots of things which need, as a TPM, you need to drive uh, and resolve. Um, you're not going to always, you know, you don't always need meetings to resolve that. One thing I've heard often is TPMs tend to set up a lot of meetings. You don't always need meetings to resolve things. I mean, the chances are like they're setting up meetings because they want to get stuff resolved. I often like, since I'm organize myself well. If I have a question for Gwen, if I see her in the kitchen, I know exactly the three things and what that I need an answer from her. And just today morning, I basically stopped by in the kitchen and I just asked her those things. And I got it resolved. I avoided a meeting, right? Or if, if I need an answer from Gwen and a couple of other engineers, just start a Slack thread, whatever, and just get it resolved offline. Avoid a meeting. If you do need meetings, when you do uh, need them, try to keep them to 30 minutes or less. The reason is, Chances are, if you set up a default meeting of an hour, you will use up that hour when you could as have resolved it like in 30 minutes. And do yourself and everyone else a favor by preparing for meetings. Like, make sure you add the agenda and make sure you start the meeting by telling folks what you're trying to get out of it. The reason, and you know, like, steer the, be present in the meeting and steer the meeting in that direction to get the outcome that you're looking for. Uh, TPMs often get labeled as people who manage without authority. And in order to do that uh, effectively, there's a few, few things they have to do. You need to earn the respect of the individuals you work with, like I said. You need to have a pulse on the you know, morale of the team. Uh, the, the reason that's important is you also build relationships with people and you get to know when things are not going to go the right way when you know the people well. Get to know the engineering teams you're working with uh, on a personal level. Grab a coffee with them. Grab lunch with them. Chances are they'll open up and talk to you about stuff in an informal setting more than in a one-on-one -on -one that you set up in a, in a uh, closed conference room. Lastly, appreciate the work when, when a project gets done, right? Like as a TPM, you move on from one project to another. Chances are that the team that built it is going to stay on and support that product. Uh, take a moment to appreciate all the work that went into this. Uh, appreciate the teams and the engineers who worked on it. Uh, people, people really like you know appreciation in words motivates people more than you think it does. All right. Yeah. Uh, so you might say that hey, great TPM worked out for you. How do how would I know if it's going to work out for me? So I've listed down like a few like about eight points here, which which I think like if if you're this person in your day-to-day -day life, outside of work, chances are you'll do reasonably well as a TPM. So you like problem solving. You, you have good communication skills. You're a people person. You enjoy uh, or you derive energy from people, right? People trust you to get stuff done. Uh, you're the organized type. So on a personal, in my, at my home, I have my own to-do list, and I manage my stuff on a regular basis, even at home. You thrive energy from getting shit done. I'm not kidding. This is like extremely important. Uh, basically, uh, what I mean by this is, you know, every time I check something off 
my to-do list, whether it's at work or at home. I actually get ple like pleasure out of it. I'm not kidding. Like I really do. And the common joke in my house is, uh, it's a joke, but the common joke in my house is that if something gets added on Kajal's to-do, it'll just get done. She won't realize it. That's not true. <laughs> they, it, uh, but that's the level of confidence that people have, that if something shows up on my to-do, it'll just get done. You like to keep in touch with technology. And lastly, you like to be the CEO for your problems. That's a term I learned at uh, my time at Zynga. But what, what be, a, be the CEO means is you like to take ownership and like to take things all the way through to the finish line. Lastly, so circling back to my career discussion, uh, career transformation uh, point from earlier, right? So being a TPM is my true calling. It, it allows me to double down on my strengths. But uh, this evening, I want to leave you guys with this thought, right? Uh, career transformations are okay. Do not be afraid to pursue your dreams. Chances are you'll make mistakes. It's okay. Acknowledge it, accept it, fix it, and move on. We spend like most of our awake time at work. So do yourself a favor and find your true calling. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to open up the floor for about 10 minutes of Q&A. Um, and um, my coworker, Cami here, she's going to be um, passing around a mic box if you do want to ask a question. Um, and um, when you do talk, please specify, please introduce yourself. Please specify what your question is for um, or if it's for, you know, general answering. Thanks. Hi, my name is Aishwarya. I work at WeWork. And my first question is for Neha. So I read in an article, like, you know, after your uh, work at LinkedIn, like, you know, there were like a lot of opportunities coming your way, like, you know, a lot of companies offering you great positions. And at one point you said, oh, I'm going to co-found found this company. So what was the trigger or what was that one moment push? Like you felt like, you know, I'm not looking for opportunities. I'm going to create opportunities. Um, so there was a point in time, uh, I remember I was in a meeting with my uh, co-founder, another big enterprise company, and we generally did that to help people out with their Kafka problems, um, you know, as good community members. And so uh, they were describing how they were using Kafka for a mission critical app. And um, my co-founder was answering uh, that question, and I was just sitting there and saying, oh, wow, you know, Kafka is mission critical in big Fortune 500 companies, and we're already helping them for free. So it's pretty uh, obvious that there will be a company around Kafka, and it will be a shame if it's not the three of us. So a fair bit amount of FOMO drove uh, my decision to ask them if they will start this company with me because uh, I didn't want to be left out of that opportunity. So that's pretty much what led to it. Anyone else? And you can talk directly into this. All right. Hi, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity, uh, all the four of you. It's been great hearing not only that authenticity is part of your company culture, but all of you four sharing this personal stories with us and your journeys is really makes me feel that you're walking the talk of your company culture and also letting our strangers know something more about you. So what I wanted to ask, I think anybody maybe Neha to you is like, uh, I am a great follower of Erika Lagamer for Women Connect from LinkedIn and I've heard constantly from a lot of things around women in, women in tech uh, communities is how you be those change agents. And uh, we always talk about issues where women are not at the seat of leadership, but I see four strong women in front of me in the seat of leadership. So how is it that you are being those change agents for women and diverse people in your company here to make sure that you are part of this influencers now? How is it that you're gonna shift this fundamental problem we have in this industry? So something, I would love to know what's happening here at Confluent for the, with all such great four women here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, if nobody wants the ball, it's, it's me <laughs> who's going to catch it. Um, I, I think we do a couple things. And um, I, I'm a believer that change um, starts at the top and it rolls uh, from there onwards, just for practical matters on how companies work. So to me, um, the first you know, change that really matters, I think, in everyday situations at Confluent is 50% of our executive team um, have women 
right? And that's uh, very unique for enterprise companies and, and just companies in general that look like us. And that sort of leadership voice at that level um, and the way it flows from there in the rest of the company, I think in many obvious and not so obvious ways uh, touches I believe most of the company. I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, here Gwen and, and others can add their, um, you know, particular thing. Uh, but I, th I think like it's it's also the sisterhood sort of, uh, you know, um, concept that I talked about a little bit earlier. Is each one of us play a role in creating that, right? So the big decisions happen on the top, but there are a lot of experiences that happen everywhere in your company, and if each one of us uh, you know, raise our voices and, and contribute towards that sisterhood, we can actually go pretty far, you know, whether it's mentoring or just simply calling, you know, uh, uh, giving credit or just sort of hearing someone out. I think all of those things matter quite a bit. So those are on the ground changes. Uh, from our perspective, I think uh, what I feel a lot of responsibility for is investment in, in inclusion, you know, not just diversity, but uh, it's really important to create an inclusive culture. And, and that's definitely not easy. But uh, we have a lot of focus on it through myriad of other activities. And it's really more about the culture and how it comes across. Question? If you could just talk directly. Sure. Hi, my name is Emily, and I work at Netflix. And I have a question about balancing open source and like for-profit things, maybe mostly for Gwen, but for anyone. Um, I'm wondering about the tension at Confluent between building things that the open source community asks for or building things for profit, and how you balance that. <laughs> People have to hear. <laughs> Go for it, Gwen. Yeah, it's not an easy question. We like profits. I mean, personally, I enjoy being paid. I have a house and two kittens to feed. Um, and uh, we also were building a company and we want it to be successful. We are proud of our work. It's not always easy to see competitors take something that you built with very hard work and see them use it for their own thing. And this is kind of part of open source. Everything you put out there is by definition to be used by everyone, including companies that you don't like and you don't want them to enjoy it. Uh, so I think it's uh, something that struggles and it's something that evolves over time. I think in the beginning we basically contributing the, almost everything and now we have uh, kind of uh, the ability to say that, uh, you know, some features are enterprisey. They are, as Nea said, some more important for five million dollar companies, less say import five hundred million dollar companies, five billion dollar companies, less important for uh, is, you know a developer working somewhere and kind of trying to be part of the community. So we're kind of mindful that uh, things that are enterprisey and worse more may be proprietary, and that's kind of like the rules of the game in a sense. That's what everyone does. Uh, versus that also being a good community citizen and helping each other out, a good way to contribute a lot that doesn't include contributing free code to companies that you may or may not like is by uh, doing a lot of code reviews and being involved in design discussions in the community. Then you are helping other people contribute, but you are not actually doing the work for other companies when it's not uh, conductive to your business goals. And uh, other things that I think is challenging, not many people ask us about it, but also once you contribute something to the open source, it's not just companies that you don't like that are going to use it. It's countries that you don't like. It's regimes that can be oppressive that could use it. So there's a lot of moral dilemmas around how you enable others by contributing to the open source. And in general, I think it, it helps to be very thoughtful. Are you, are you contributing the right things for the right reasons and how is it going to have wider impact in the world? If you could just talk directly into it. Hi, my name is Deepa, and I come from Cisco today. 
Uh, my question is for Julie. Um, Julie, I have uh, double digit experience as an IC and I'm looking to, uh, I've always been looking to transition into a manage, manager uh, role, but the, one of the biggest things that stops me is now I become responsible for a team. So in terms of um, time commitment, do you see that a person who's IC is more flexible in time versus, I mean, when you become a manager, then you have to now adhere to your employees' times, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that's something I, uh, I keep debating myself with. So if you can share something around that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think the question is around like, flexibility when you are IC, like what's, what's the difference when you're a manager? Um, I would say uh, most, well, I, I think most of the company I work for, um, we have flexible working hours, especially here. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's like we are fortunate to live in the era which is like more with all technology help um, and, uh, you know, company culture, valuing culture and diversity and women and family. I think uh, it's actually pretty uh, doable, either you IC or manager. Uh, so that's like, one high level thing and between IC and manager, um, I would say it, have, it has different challenges. Um, uh, it really depends on what, like at end of the day, what really motivates you, right? What really, you really enjoy doing. Uh, so I think for IC, it really like, you, like the thing that motivates you is like getting this thing done and really going really deep and a like craftsmanship, you know, all this technology you can adopt to solve the problem. Like it's very uh, kind of specific problem solving um, and depth of a technology there. Uh, but for manager, it's different, right? So the thing, the rewarding you're getting is not necessarily solving one particular problem, but more of empowering the team, managing a team, setting strategy, uh, you know, helping team member to grow and deliver a bigger impact as a team, amplify each other, right? So, um, and also like growing your team member. So that, that's two different things that you will get all of the job. Uh, so end of the day, like re really what really matter to you, what really um, um, motivates you to feel excited to go to work should be the primary driver. So for me, I, yeah, I would say, but definitely it's, it's not very easy to answer when you don't really uh, get the feel of the job, right? So that's why it's very hard to take the first step. So for me, when I was working at IC, uh, as I mentioned, I never thought about taking a leadership role. And my manager at LinkedIn at that time was very encouraging and she, she's also a woman as well. She basically pushed me and said, hey, give it a try. And I was like, I'm not sure. I, I don't really know if that's something I want. I have two kids. You know, I want a flexibility. I want to, you know, maybe just don't, man, don't mind that much. But uh, keep it open-minded, give it a try, and you get a taste of it, right? So then I, I, I took the step, and it was very frustrating the even first couple of years, but I, I definitely got a taste of, you know, the pleasure and enjoyment when you really, like, grow your team member and see their, uh, their growth. And really, it's it, it just different type of reward when you're on that role. So I think um, be open-minded, um, you know, try to use mentorship intern like, or like managing intern to get a feel of being a manager. See if that's really excites you and f make you feel fulfilled at work. And then gradually you can kind of, um, you know, make a bigger step. Yeah, but flexibility wise, I feel it's pretty much the same. <laughs> Hi, I'm Madhumita, I'm from LinkedIn. I'm a huge fan of Kajol sitting here. Uh, one thing I really saw in all of you is act like owner. Is that the secret sauce where you are today? And if you would like to advise any other secret sauce to become like you one of the day, uh, so what that would be. And would love to hear from each of you. Yeah. I guess Madhu, you know me pretty well. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think act like an owner is a big part of, uh, you know, I mean, act like an owner with, I would add a caveat there, without the expectation that you're always going to get rewarded for it, right? Like, I think doing the right thing for the right reasons is extremely important, rather than just 
doing it because it like you think that oh if i do this then i'm going to get promoted or something it's it's extremely important to just like i said be the ceo of your problems and take everything through to the finish line cool so is the question uh, share secret career advice <laughs> um so i i think there are a couple things to say but i'll, I'll say one thing is um you know when you when you're in a company in a new role whether you're switching into a new role or you're just new into a company um i typically like to advise um uh, that you start your six months by just being the pain resolver on the team and uh you know the thing that it does is it kind of establishes trust and it uh, you know wins people over and uh it, it it sort of allows you to be an expert in whatever you know new team you're in and from there onward you want to start about you know thinking about what are the new projects what are the cool opportunities but being useful to the team right from the get go by just taking pain away is really useful especially when you're in a hyper growth kind of startup so that's just as is a, a, a secret that i've followed that i've found very useful in my career uh i don't know why i'm holding the mic but, uh questions for everyone huh <laughs> uh yeah i think maybe one thing i will add is um um yeah i think again like you need to really love what you do like and then you will have the ownership right so you feel like it also like i i call that like do what's right i think it's 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 very hard to make everybody happy and you need to make a trade off all the time like departing your projects and like whatever right? so it's a lot of hard decision every day like but really like feel the true love of what you do and then you really want to make do the right thing for it like the whatever choice is to do you hold yourself accountable for is that the right thing for this project to be successful is it the right thing for the company to be successful that what that's what puts you at ease right so you know you did the conscious choice and then that's what keep you going yeah it says it i would just want to put emphasis on something that julie just said which is that there is always way more that you want to do than hours in the day and being very mindful about what you say yes to and saying yes to something means saying no to maybe 500 other things that you can have do, done during that time is super important and really starting each day by thinking what are the most important things to focus on what are the most important problems on my plate what are the things that really require my focus because it's so easy to get lost especially as you kind of move up a lot of demands on your time everyone has something that they kind of want or need lots of questions you can get lost in slack for weeks and never find like what happened to my uh, quarter i was kind of answering some questions here and there so really focusing down what are the things that really require my attention what are the things that worth my attention is really the key okay hi i'm amy um I work in term of like product side and I really want to ask you guys a question is can be any of you can answer this so in term of products things um I want to know like since your product is the open source and you can see like some of other can be your competitor how do you make your product unique and stand out and encourage your customer to buy in or like you know hungry to get that product and another question is like what is your um short term plan like to be process plan for this and the long term plan like the future goal for your company in terms of the products <laughs> i'm sorry it might be a long question okay. so uh, i think the first one was a little generic so uh, let me let me attempt that first and then i'll come to confluence so we, you're asking a legitimate question which is when your main product is open source you know what are companies going to pay you for uh you know except just supporting that open source project so i think that the the, the first thing you want to do is is really listen to what your customers are doing with the product often times as when was saying earlier in open source communities kind of help scale development but uh, they don't quite scale sort of mission criticality at the same time right so it kind of works for the first use case it kind of works to you know get the adoption going but once you adopt it for something serious then there are lots of things that you need to do 
So coming back to Conclone, what do we do, right? Uh, if you think about how people use our products, there's a lot of data everywhere. So if you look at enterprise reality, there's data in data centers, there's data in public clouds. Oftentimes companies have some flavor of all of the above. So we offer you a fully managed service. So it's not just open source Kafka that you download and tinker with. We actually offer you fully managed service. It's run by experts here at Confluent. And the value proposition is really the 24 seven uptime, right? The, the scale and the manageability of it. So that's on one side, right? On the software platform, we further differentiate it. And uh, the, the way we differentiate it is essentially we go back to the, what is mission critical mean, right? What does it mean for our customers? And it could mean security. It could mean management and operations. It could mean monitoring. It could mean connectors to hundreds of different systems. This is not what a community is typically good at, you know, to manage completeness of a product. So, you know, what we often say is, you know, Kafka is a great engine and we like to deliver you the whole car and that's what we get paid for. And that's how we differentiate also. Cool. All right, was that the wrap of the Q&A? All right, so we're gonna stick around for a little bit for networking. If you have more questions that you weren't able to ask here, I'm looking forward to, and all of us will be here.